if you haven't already, then go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. And we're looking at a pretty famous passage, a lot of famous verses contained therein, but maybe you haven't seen these verses in their context before. And so um, the book of Romans is a, is a pretty thorough book. Paul's got a kind of a reasoned argument that develops over time. And since we're just starting in Romans chapter 5 without context, I thought while you're turning there, I would kind of tell you where we are up to this point. So in Romans chapter 1, Paul sort of brings a condemnation on all people, that every single one of us has turned away from God. And then in Romans chapter 2, he says that means that we don't have any room to condemn other people because we ourselves have sinned. And then in Romans chapter 3, he reiterates that there's none who does good, that there's none righteous, not even one. But then he shows that even though we all fall short of the glory of God, that there's grace, that we're justified freely by his grace, so that there's no boasting. And then he uses Romans chapter 4, the argument from Abraham that Abraham was believed God and he, it was credited to him as righteousness. And then he says in Romans 4, 5, that to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And then the rest of chapter 4, Paul lays out the debate and demonstrates that righteousness, justification, comes simply by faith. And so then we arrive at Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, he's assuming that we already, as the reader, understand that justification is by faith, because he's just laid out the argument. So he's writing to a group of people who now, as we get to chapter 5, they see that justification is by faith. It's the, it's the presumption. And for most of us in this room, I would guess that you understand, too, that justification is by faith. And so then what Paul's going to ask is, okay, what now? If justification is by faith, we understand that, what else do we need to know? And so uh, it's easy sometimes to forget the goodness of the gospel, the benefits that we have in Christ, the hope that we have in the midst of trials. It's easy to forget that. And when we do, we cease to boast in God. When, when we forget the goodness of the gospel, we cease to boast in him. And we'll see that our primary applications, as, as we see in the text, he says, boast in these things. He says that over and over and over again. So in this passage, in Romans chapter 5, we're going to see four big ideas. We're going to see the benefits of righteousness in Romans 5, 1 through 2. We'll see hope in the trials in 3 through 5. We'll see the proof of God's love, and then we'll see the extent of God's love. So let's get into it. In verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first benefit of righteousness is peace with God. And, and this is the kind of peace that is objective. So, for example, there's, there's sort of the peace that you get when you feel peace, right? So that's what's sometimes called the peace of God, uh, as you see in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. When you're anxious, God provides peace. But that's not actually the peace that it's talking about here. This is the objective standing that we have before God. We are at peace. If you notice in verse 10, it, it says, while we were enemies. That's how it starts, verse 10. See, we were once enemies of God, but now we're at peace with God. In April of 1945, Berlin was completely surrounded on the east side by the Soviets and on the west side by the Allied forces, uh, France, Germany, the United States. And so Germany surrendered. It was an unconditional surrender. And in that moment... Our state, our relationship with Germany moved from war to peace, complete peace. And not only that, but then we came in with the Marshall Plan and we rebuilt Germany from the ground up. It wasn't just a ceasefire, but it was peace. It was reconciliation. It was being brought back into relationship. And that's the peace that we have with God. So having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So notice that there's the assumption that we already know that we've been justified. He says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ that we receive justification. Justification simply means to be declared righteous, that the moment you believe in him, he looks at you and he declares you righteous. 
And that comes through Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven by which we might be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Through him, we have peace with God. But furthermore, we also see that we have access into grace. So if you notice, um, if you're reading out of the NASB like I am, it says, uh, verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. But if you're reading out of any other translation, it probably says access, yes? And so I actually really like that translation. I like the, I think it is a good representation of the word. So through whom we also have obtained our access or our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And this word access has kind of the idea of coming into the presence of someone or something of a higher standing. So it can also be translated access. And let me show you that in Ephesians chapter two, it says, for through him, we both have our access and one spirit to the Father. Okay, so it has this idea of being brought into the presence of or being introduced into the presence of something higher, something greater. So we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we do stand in grace because everything we do is by the grace of God. And so not only do we have peace with God, but we get to stand in a state of grace. Through Jesus Christ, we've been introduced, brought into, granted access to the grace in which we now stand. And then he says, not only this, uh, continuing in verse two, it says, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We exult in the hope of the glory of God. And if, uh, if you're reading out of the NIV, this word is translated boast, And I think that's a really good translation of that word, boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. A lot of other translations say rejoice. I really like the word boast. Um, So we have access into grace, but then we have the hope of the glory of God. That having been justified by faith, we have peace, we have access, and then we can also boast in the hope of the glory of God. So what is then the hope of the glory of God? What is the hope of the glory of God? Well, I think it's two things. I think it's his coming and glorification. The hope of his coming and the hope of glorification. See, when Jesus comes, it says that we're looking forward to the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That Jesus is coming again, and this is the blessed hope. That we have hope that Jesus is coming back. Right now, we're celebrating his first coming, that he came to the earth and became a man, that he died for sin and rose again. But we have a blessed hope that he's coming back. And when he comes back, Colossians 3, 4 tells us that when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So that the coming of Jesus is not just that he's coming in glory, but that when he comes, we will be transformed in glory. And that's part of the hope of the glory of God, is that we too will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 says he'll come in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we will all be changed. We'll be glorified. And right now in Romans chapter 5, but in Romans chapter 8, Paul alludes to this hope that we have by saying that I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this is Romans 8, 18, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And then in verse 22, he says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our redemption as sons and the redemption of our body. That's the hope that we have, that the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, when he comes, we too will be changed. This world has fallen. This world has its problems. It's not the way God made it to be. God made the world perfect in the Garden of Eden, and now it's fallen. But it's not going to stay this way. When Jesus comes back, he's going to make us new. He's going to make creation new. And we will be reconciled to God, to people, and to creation. That that's our future hope. And we get to have that hope because we have been justified by faith. We've been justified by faith, so we have peace with God. We have access into grace, and then we also have the hope the hope of Jesus coming, and the hope of our glory. So we have hope. So these are the things, the benefits of righteousness that we have. We have peace, access, hope. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. 
We boast in them. And he says, verse 3, not only this, but we also exult or boast in our tribulations, our trials, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we see that we have hope in the trials. We have hope in the trials. And the first thing that we see is that we have perseverance. The trials actually produce perseverance. And, and the perseverance produces character, proven character. And our proven character produces hope. So the word perseverance has this idea of to remain under, to remain under. And sometimes that's what it is, right? We go through a trial and we just remain under the trial. And uh, as I was preparing for this passage, I asked a few friends who I know have gone through some trials and I just asked them, how has this passage been true for you? How has it been true that that the trial has produced perseverance, proven character and hope? And uh, one of my friends said something really good. He said, he said, I love the word perseverance because that's really what it is. You just endure day by day knowing that God will see you through. And he said that perseverance is entering a race that you have no idea how long you'll be running. There's perseverance in the midst of the trial. It produces perseverance because you have no idea how long you'll be running, but you have hope. And so we exult, we boast in our tribulations knowing that it brings about perseverance. And the beauty of the trial is that the perseverance that it produces, you can then in the next trial run a little longer because it produces perseverance. And the perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. This word proven character has the idea of testing and refining, that when you go through trials, you're being tested and refined. It has the idea of being examined, and that as you go through the trial and it produces perseverance, you're tested and your character is proven. And then finally, there's hope. This word hope means eager anticipation and it does not disappoint. And in the midst of our trials, there are a number of hopes that do disappoint, yes? I hope my dad comes to this baseball game because he hasn't come to any of my games this season, right? I hope I'm not affected by the upcoming layoffs. We have all these hopes that disappoint. But this hope does not disappoint, why? Because, verse 5, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. God shares his love with you through his indwelling. The, the holy God indwells you. Every single person who's put their faith in Christ is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And it says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So you have hope and you have love because God has poured out his Holy Spirit within your hearts. So um, hope does not disappoint because ultimately the Holy Spirit is actually the down payment of glory. So let me show you this. In Ephesians chapter one, he says, in him, that's in Jesus Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit who's been poured out in your hearts is actually a down payment that God says there's more coming. You think you stand in grace now? You've been introduced in the grace in which we stand? He's poured out the Holy Spirit in your hearts as a promise of more to come. He's the down payment and that produces hope because we know that it's not just this. That in the midst of our trials, this is not what we're destined for. He also says in 2 Corinthians 1.21, he says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and who anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So the Holy Spirit is a pledge of the glory of the future. And so we have in verse two, the hope of the glory of God, but then in the midst of the trials, that hope of the glory of God, that future hope gives us hope in the present. So having been justified by faith, we know what God's done for us in the past, 
and the Holy Spirit being the down payment of our future glory. We know what God's going to do in the future. That gives us hope in the present. So not only this, verse 3, we boast, we exult in our tribulations knowing that it brings perseverance, proven character, and hope. Boasting in trials, boasting in tribulations is not the same as celebrating them, right? It's not the same as being happy about them. And I think oftentimes we think that we're supposed to be happy in the midst of our trials. But that's not what it says. It says boast in the midst of your trials. Boast in what God's doing, knowing that he's redeeming the trials. God, God does not desire your pain except that he desires your refining, your proven character. And even when you look at the, the trials of Lazarus passing away, he passed away and his friends are sad. Jesus wept. Even though he knew he was going to work that trial for glory, he still wept. And when we're in the midst of our trials, Jesus weeps with us. It, it, it's not saying that we're supposed to be happy in the midst of our trials, but that we're supposed to boast because we know that God will see us through. And how many of us have been through trials where God took us through, and on the back end, we can look back and say, look what God did, and we can boast in that. And it's a testimony to the rest of the world of how good, how good and great our God is. And so knowing what God has done for us in the past gives us the confidence to boast in the present. You may be in the midst of a trial right now, and you think, how in the world can I boast? But you boast because of what he's done in the past. And you know what he'll do in the future. You trust his promises and you have a hope that does not disappoint because the Holy Spirit, the love of God has been poured out in your hearts through the Holy Spirit. So then in this next section, we see that sometimes we don't feel the love of God. You might be asking, what if I don't feel God's love in the midst of my trial? You're telling me that I have, I have hope in my trial, but I don't, I don't feel the love of God. You're telling me the love of God has been poured out in my heart to the Holy Spirit, but I'm in the midst of some real tough stuff, right? You don't know what I'm going through, and you're telling me that this is the love of God poured out, that I have hope in this? What happens if I don't feel the love of God in my trial? Well, he shows us the proof of his love, the proof of God's love, that even if you don't feel God's love, the Holy Spirit in your heart, even if you don't feel what God is doing in the midst of your trial, while we were still helpless, verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. So notice verse 5 says, the love of God has been poured out. Verse 5 says, it's true. God loves you, and he's poured out that love on you through the Holy Spirit. But then in verse 8 it says, but God demonstrates his love, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that when you're in the midst of your trial, and you don't have hope, and you don't feel God's love, you can look to the cross and God says, look here and know that I love you. God demonstrates his love for you and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Christ died for you. And so John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He demonstrates his love in his death. And notice, it, it, there's a few things here. So it was while we were still helpless. Uh, it could also be translated weak. Um, so while we were weak, Christ died for us. He died for us while we were weak, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners. While we were weak, ungodly, sinners. And he says, one will hardly die, verse 7, for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the fact that God would die for us when we didn't deserve it is the whole point. You don't deserve it. And that's how you know he loves you. So he died for us while we were weak, ungodly sinners. Now, not only this, but much more, verse 9, 
Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So we see the extent of God's love, that much more, not only has he demonstrated his love, that he died for us, but much more Now, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Saved. And so, first we see that we've been justified. And then we see we've been saved from wrath. And then reconciled, as it says in verse 10. And then finally, it says once more, saved by his life in verse 10. Saved from the power and presence of sin. So, I want to point out in verse 9, much more than... Okay? Not only has God demonstrated his love, but much more than now, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath. So I already mentioned this earlier, but justified means declared righteous. That when God looks at you, he says, righteous, because Jesus Christ is in you. You've been justified. You've been declared righteous. And like I said, in, in verse 1, we already have this assumption that we have been justified by faith. So we've been justified, we've been declared righteous. And it says by his blood, because Jesus' death, Jesus' shed blood is the basis of our justification. In other words, if he had not died, we could not be raised to life, right? So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life because Jesus died on the cross. So not only does his death on the cross prove his love for you, but it also allows you to be justified by faith. So his death is a demonstration of his love, but it's also a provision for our justification. So we've been justified by his blood, and we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So we're saved from the wrath of God. In other words, saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the penalty of sin. So Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death and into life. Does not come into judgment. So we've been saved from the wrath of God because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. So much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. We were declared righteous and saved from the penalty of sin. But then he says that we have a restored relationship with God. Notice verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we'll be, we shall be saved by his life. So we've been reconciled to God. And reconciliation is a restoration from hostility to harmony between two parties. It's, it's a restoration from us, with, with us to God. So we've been restored in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all of these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So I, I mentioned a while ago about uh, World War II. As it ended, we became at peace with Germany. But I want you to think about another war for a minute. I want you to think about the Korean War. So for the last 50 years, 60 years, there's been no, no guns fired between North and South Korea. They, they, they haven't done anything major, right? No one's invading one another. So they're at peace, right? They're reconciled, they, right? They're, no, <laughs> okay? Obviously, they, they have soldiers stacked up on the border. They stare at each other all day long. They don't even move, okay? And that's not peace. And oftentimes, we have this idea that by having peace with God, that, that it's just neutral. God says, okay, I'm no longer upset. Have a good one. But no, God has reconciled us to himself. He has brought us back into full restored relationship with him. That peace with God means reconciliation with God. We've been reconciled to him. While we were enemies, he reconciled us. While we were enemies, he reconciled us through the death of his son. And much more, now having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved by his life. So I see two things here being saved by his life. I see intercession and resurrection. Let me explain. So 
We often talk about salvation with respect to being saved from the penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we, we also are saved from the power of sin. The power of sin is the flesh, the flesh which pulls us toward the desire to sin. But the Holy Spirit has been poured out in our hearts so that if we walk in the Spirit, we don't carry out the desires of the flesh, right? So we're saved from the power, but we're also saved from the presence of sin. We will be saved from the presence of sin at the resurrection. So Jesus, being saved by his life, says he lives, he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. In other words, Jesus is standing before the Father making intercession for you, pleading to the Father on your behalf. He, he prays for you. He's making intercession for you. And so we are saved by his life, that he lives forever making intercession for you. Like the old hymn, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. Comes from this verse. So then he says, we were reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Um, but, but there's also the resurrection. So in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man came death, by a man also, that's Jesus, came the resurrection of the dead. So by Adam came death, but by Jesus came resurrection. And like I had mentioned before, all of us who are in Christ will one day be raised and will be saved from the very presence of sin. So we are saved by his life, that not only did Jesus die he also rose again. In the same passage in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if we're worshiping someone who didn't rise again, we are most of all to be pitied. But Jesus rose again. And because he rose again, we too will rise again and will be saved from the very presence of sin. And not only this, verse 11, but we also boast, exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, to, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We are reconciled, and so we boast in God. We're reconciled, and so we boast in God. We boast in his love. So having been justified by faith, we have peace. We have obtained access or introduction into the grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God that when Jesus comes, he comes in glory and he will raise us up in glory. We'll be saved from this world. And then, not only this, that we boast in our tribulations. We can boast in our tribulations because our tribulations produce endurance, perseverance. And our perseverance produces proven character and proven character, hope which does not disappoint. We have a hope that does not disappoint. Why? Because God has guaranteed through the giving of his Holy Spirit, his love for you. And if you forget that in the midst of your trial, if you don't believe that God loves you or you don't see his love in the midst of the chaos, God demonstrates his love for you and that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And so we've been reconciled, we've been justified, we've been saved from the wrath of God and then we are being saved from the power of sin and will be saved from the presence of sin. And so we are justified, saved from wrath, reconciled, and saved from the power in presence of sin. So first thing to do is to boast in the glory of God. Right? He tells us to do this. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Jesus will one day return in glory, our blessed hope our blessed hope. And when he comes, we too will be glorified. So share this hope with others. What it means to, to boast in the hope is, in part, is to share it. And 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. As other people see your hope in the midst of trials, they ask, where does this hope come from? Boast in what God is doing. Share your hope with others. And in 1 John 3, 3, it says, uh, well, actually going back to verse 2, it says, we know that we will be like him when he comes because we will see him just as he is. And then it says this, everyone who has this hope fixed on him 
purifies himself. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. And then secondly, we are to boast in the trials. And I know that's hard. I know it's hard to say in the midst of your despair, in the midst of your trial, it's hard to boast. But we're to boast in the trials because God is refining you and he's seeing you through. So rejoice. And James 1, 2 through 4 says, consider all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Rejoice in the midst of trials. You don't have to be happy that you're going through the trial, but rejoice in what God is doing in you and through you for his glory as you go through the trial. Boast in the trials. And finally, boast in God's love. God has a proven love for you. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of more to come, and he has died for you and risen for you and lives to make intercession for you. He has a proven love, and you have access to him through Jesus Christ. So boast in the hope of the glory of God, boast in the trials, and boast in God's love. May we never forget that the gospel provides not just eternal life, but it also produces hope in the present and hope for the future because God will see us through and keep his promises.